I'm quite new, so I apologize for my lack of knowledge regarding this creature. One thing I must come out and say before I go on to tell this story is that this encounter did not happen anywhere near Navajo land. Therefore, I am leaning more towards a Wendigo, or not deer. If I should move this, please let me know. It was late summer, and my mom and I had decided we should go out for a spontaneous hike. We did our research and found one that said it was a four mile round trip. Sounded easy enough. We got up early that morning and began our trek. The entire forest had a horrible vibe. Even my mother picked up on it. She's never been into any of the paranormal, etc. We've been walking for hours now, and this forest just seemed to get weirder and weirder. We had plenty of water and food, so I really can't say if we were just dehydrated or tired. We began to hear singing in the woods, and we just stopped and stared at each other. We had to be miles into the woods by now, our step counter saying we have well surpassed the promised four miles. Where exactly were we? Where would the singing be coming from? We just looked at each other and began laughing. I remember her saying, no way, shaking her head, and carrying on. It's been quite some time now, and we have not encountered another person on this trail. Suddenly, this man walking really fast surpasses us and rounds a bend behind a rocky hill so we cannot see him anymore. He said no words, just came up behind us and darted past. Again, me and my mother laughed and envied his athleticism until we rounded the bend ourselves to find that he is completely gone. Out of sight, the path after that bend was fairly straight and you could see far ahead of you so there is no way he would have been able to clear that entire area fast. This time, my mom stops and says, you gotta be kidding me. We're thoroughly freaked out after this. Eventually, we reach the peak, and after walking that long, you'd think somebody would probably want to stay there for a while and enjoy the view. Well, we pretty much got to the top, looked, and then left. We never discussed it, but I could tell we were both uncomfortable and just wanted to get out of here. We're maybe halfway back through this trail now, and the sun is beginning to set. We're moving fast to get out of here. Our step counter said that we had hiked 10 miles compared to the four. As the forest got darker, I began to hear leaves crunching behind us. I reluctantly turned around and noticed it was a buck several yards away. We hurried along as to not disturb it further, but then I began noticing something. It was following us from a distance. It did so, almost like a predator, hiding and peeking. I tell my mom we're being followed by that deer, and we're pretty much at a jog now. The buck would not let us go. I would sometimes notice that it would catch up and follow just beside us. It always remained several yards away though, always lurking head down. I've lived out in the country my whole life and have seen all the deer you can ever imagine. I've never been followed by one like this. This seemed more than just curiosity. It felt horrible predatory. I felt like I was in danger, always hearing those footsteps behind me, the feeling of being watched. Clearly, we made it out unharmed, but I wonder if it actually intended to harm us or if it was just ushering us out of the forest. All in all, it was a freaky experience. Something is up with those woods. Last year, 
I was living in a small mountain town in central southern Colorado, in the Rio Grande National Forest, a super small town. Ute natives were tragically killed in the entire area of the town. I don't usually get creepy vibes when I'm there, but it's definitely weird in many ways. I was in my car at 2 a.m. with a friend. We were parked outside our house, looking down the road with only the streetlight across the street, lighting up the area. From 15 yards in front of us, we see a large animal emerge from the darkness and catch the light. We started asking each other, what is that? It's so big. Like the size of a small horse or a big deer. It walks toward us and stands one yard away from my door. We were frozen, unable to move while we stare at it so close to us. And I say, is that a wolf? It's all I could think it could be. Tall, completely silver, looked like a wolf from a movie. As it stands so close to us, it looks up to the sky to the left, then the right. Then, it runs away, toward the large cliffs at the back of the town, where the abandoned mines are, and a large forest begins. We were stunned, stayed frozen and silent for minutes until we began laughing, eventually calmed down and went inside, confused as hell. After that, I told some co-workers thinking how cool it was that I saw a wolf. They all said it was impossible. No wolves have lived there for decades. So I research. They're right. No wolves have been here for like 40 years, and it would be a miracle if I had seen one, especially a gray wolf. As I look at more pictures of wolves, my memory becomes more clear. What I saw was too tall and silver to even be a gray wolf. My friend and I have not forgotten one detail of the story. I'm sure it was not a dog. If it was, that's the biggest dog in existence. I remember the world washing away as I stared at its shining fur. It was the most majestic animal I've ever seen. There were chills covering my body, and I could barely breathe. Do you think that I saw a skinwalker? I'm not sure how to begin this. This didn't just affect me, but my family in different ways, and it continued to mess with me for years after we moved from the house where it all started. I'm trying to take something that did many things over several years and just trim it down to details that seem important. I'm sorry if this reads weird or awkward. My grandmother was supposed to have traced her side of the family all the way back to an unregistered family of natives that escaped the Trail of Tears, and after telling a person this strange thing that I normally kept secret, they suggested that it might be a skinwalker. But I don't know. I know there are a lot of family strife in that house where the haunting started that bubbled up to the surface. A spirit there liked to scare me by calling my name, slamming doors, giving me strange nightmares, and even mimicking the voices of family to other members. The first time I can think of it appearing is when we were coming back from a road trip at night. Dad was driving, and he hits the brakes hard and swerves because he'd seen a wolf with no eyes stepping out into our lane and look at our oncoming car. And because everybody else was asleep, he was the only one to see it, and there was nobody around to suggest that anything had physically been there. The second time I think it showed itself was many years after. We had long moved from the house that this all started in. I was home alone at night, messaging a friend and I seen a huge figure walking up the road. I was frozen in fear as it approached, and eventually
passed by the house we were living in, and what I remember was something with a strange skull, kind of like that of a monkey skull, as a head or covering its head, and the rest completely hidden behind a cloak of some sort, of dark colored fur. It hasn't been around for a bit now, but while it was around, or possibly pursuing me, it had caused a lot of hardship for me and my family. I remember that if I talked or thought about it too much, I would draw its attention back to me when it seemed like it had left, and I would have let my guard down. Whatever it is always made me feel terrified and unsafe. I used to have symbols of protection from whatever religion I could think of to try and find some sort of protection from it. I'm not sure what this entity is, but this is not a story I share much, as I know how it sounds, and I don't want to go through the normal ridicule and dismissive comments. So this was when I was a lot younger, and I lived in Texas, probably around nine years old. You know how when you're younger, you just don't remember as many details and it all seems kind of dreamlike. And this was like that, except I'm almost 100% sure it's not a dream based on how clearly I can visualize certain aspects of it. I should just get into the story, but if you've had similar encounters, please tell me. Anyway, I love animals. Like, I just love watching nature documentaries about them and studying them. And when I lived in Texas, we had a farmer's pasture at the back of my house, separated by a rusty cattle fence that was around six to seven feet tall. Based on the fact that we had to climb a fair way to get over it when we accidentally lost balls on the other side of the fence. The cows would sometimes come within looking distance of the back of my house. The farmer's pasture was huge since we were in a semi rural area and that day I could see them in the distance, so I went out to watch them and trying to lure them over to me. I had been gazing intently at them for I don't know how long, when I looked to my right and saw a huge buck next to me. It couldn't have been more than a foot from me at most, but I never heard it come up beside me, nor do I know why it would have done so, seeing as deer are very easily spooked at the slightest movement. Anyway, at the same time as I saw it, it saw me. We locked eyes, and that's what I remember best, was that its eyes were oddly intelligent and humanish, and it seemed benevolent. We stared at each other for at most 30 seconds before it was gone over the cattle fence with a metallic clang. I can only assume that its back hooves struck the fence on the way over, because I remember the clanging noise and it rattling like a metal fence if you kicked it. I think I was also grasping the fence tightly, because I remember that I felt the force of the metal as the buck clipped it. I looked out to the field to follow where it had gone and saw another big deer, a doe I think bound into the smallish thicket that was probably 200 to 300 feet away from the fence. After they both disappeared into the thicket, I could not catch sight of them anymore, and I ran in to tell my mom what I had seen. I told her that it clipped the fence on the way over, and I remember her saying that it was probably a yearling. That ends my encounter, but there's some weird things about it more than the already weird premise that I wanted to point out. Number one, the buck was huge. I think I came up to its shoulders. Now, I was nine, so it makes sense, I guess. It just seemed really big for a yearling. Number two, how could it have walked up to the fence and not noticed me standing there? It just seems very, very unlikely. Furthermore, how did we manage to look at each other at the same time without noticing one another before? 
and why did it hold my gaze for so long? It seemed benevolent. If it was a skinwalker, I don't know why it would be, but that's all I can think of. As I mentioned before, it seemed intelligent. Maybe that was just my kid brain, shocked at all. But it seemed as though it was staring into the depths of my soul when we locked eyes. The buck and other deer bounded into the small thicket and then completely disappeared. I couldn't see them afterwards, even though I'm pretty sure I spent at least a minute looking for them. The thicket wasn't big either, so I should have been able to spot their silhouettes or something. Anyway, that's all I can think of for now. Me and my friend were driving down the road. He and I were just driving at like 11 at night. We were coming home from a friend's house, and we were just listening to music really loud. Firstly, the radio started going off. It then played I Stand Alone by Godsmack, which we don't have downloaded on his phone. My friend Calvin said, Did you change the song? And I said, No. I'm on my phone. What? Then Calvin said, I don't even have this downloaded. Not a minute later, it turns off and goes to static. We just sat in silence for a moment, and then it started playing other music I did not recognize. I was shaking, and I think he was too. Calvin said, you're not messing with me, right? And I said, no dude, I'm shaking. This is freaking me out. Then, his light bar went out on his truck. We both screamed, and I admit, I was actually about to cry. I've had similar experiences, but nothing this bizarre. The light bar came back on. At this point, something the size of our truck ran in the middle of the road and ran across. We were screaming things like, Dude, what is that? We saw it in the rearview mirror as well, and as we passed the song, the skinwalker started playing on the song. We didn't have this downloaded, and I never heard it. It was just the beginning, so it ended the song fast. But it all stopped. The static stopped. The light bar was on. We couldn't see it in the mirror anymore. At this point, we were going 80 miles an hour down a hill that's meant for 50, and we're just hoping to get back to civilization soon. We were at least 30 minutes from my home, and the nearest neighborhood, so we tried to talk about it. Our music resumed again, and it was normal. This all happened in the span of 5 or 8 minutes. I don't know what happened, and I know it sounds too good to be true, and it sounds almost too perfect, but... I just hope it at least entertained you or allowed me to share my story. Have a good night and enjoy yourselves. Cindy was my best friend at the time, so she came with me to this new house. Sorry for the bad formatting in advance, as I am on mobile. I have never shared my story on here, as I'm not sure what it was because I don't live anywhere near a res. I live in Florida. I cannot think of any rational explanation for what I saw, however. First some backstory. I lived in a city nearish Orlando and went to school with a girl who I will call Cindy. My mother worked at a different school nearby as a teacher. We were going to move towards central Florida in a very rural, absolute middle of nowhere area after school had ended. So, it was Cindy and I's last day of school, but my mom still had to teach for another week. She drove us out to the new house to stay there on our own for an entire week while she finished work and would stay with my grandmother in town. So, Cindy and I are so excited to have the new house to ourselves for a week and to go get set up in my room and stuff. We decided that we wanted to still go on late walks like we used to, and thought about going that night. We agreed we should go while it's still light out, 
because we don't know the area that well. All my area was a giant square-shaped road, or block. It wasn't really a block, though, because any houses there were just a mailbox and a gate on the road with a driveway that went out for like half a mile until you saw the house. So, we're walking on this square road around dusk and we get to the corner of the road, go to turn and watch this absolutely massive deer walk out of one side of the road from the trees, maybe 50 yards ahead of us. We kind of just stopped or slowed to look for a second because although I'm from up north, she'd never seen a deer being from the city and I had never seen one so close. This thing also was a buck, and again, huge, so I told her not to get too close, as it could be dangerous. All this happened in like five seconds, while it walked to the middle of the road. Then, this deer stops in its tracks, turns its head to look at us, and just stared for what felt like ten seconds, realistically. We just kind of watched this deer like a staring contest. Then, it turns its head forwards again, stands up on its hind legs, and starts limp walking into the other side of the trees. Then, we just watched the trees rustle a ton and walked home. That's when we were like, yeah, did we see that? We hadn't walked the rest of the week, and mom came home earlier than expected, so we felt better. So here's where I'm not sure of anything. This deer's legs were not only what they should look like. A deer's legs are opposite of ours or a dog's. When they stand on all fours, their back knees pointed behind them instead of in front. This deer's legs did not point behind them. Its knees faced forwards, as if they had been twisted around perfectly. My mom worked in her family butcher shop as a kid and had seen deer brought in with ankles that were twisted and broken and healed in a completely new position. It makes sense, as they can walk on three legs as that one heals. I can't see how this could have healed both of its legs, or how they both twist so perfectly, or especially how it would walk on those legs alone. I think the fact that its legs were backwards is why it somewhat limped forwards although it clearly didn't have any broken or twisted bones. It did not appear to be in pain. It had antlers. No idea if it had ears or a tail. I hear everybody say it won't have a tail if it's a skinwalker. I had no idea what skinwalkers or any cryptids were at this point. All I paid attention to was its size, which had to be at least eight feet tall, standing with a slight hunch, and its legs. I remember we mentioned it smelt like a rotten egg. I don't recall a coppery scent. It could just have been sulfur, but I'm not sure. Despite looking this thing right in the eyes, it was too far away to even see them, and my horrible vision, of course. So I can't tell you what those looked like either. I didn't look for all the telltale signs you look for in a skinwalker, because again, I'd never even heard of them. I have so many questions about this experience. Why didn't it try and attack us? Why was it in the middle of Florida? Why would it almost show us that it walked like that instead of, I don't know, keeping its cool? If that's not what it is, what did I see? Cindy and I are no longer friends, so I'm not sure if she'd even remember. I think the only reason it stuck with me is when I heard stories about skinwalkers, I felt my heart sink into my stomach and remembered this. I do have a Navajo friend who refuses to speak about this with me, and I fully believe skinwalkers exist if that's not what I saw. I've heard of flesh gates, but I have trouble believing other things because they don't have Navajo ties, which my friend does and clearly believes in. I don't know how much about flesh gates except they're basically skinwalkers without Native American connotations. 
Maybe that's what I saw. Maybe this deer was also just severely deformed. Have you ever seen anything like this? And this was about five or six years ago, by the way. The stories of Navajo medicine men, or shamans having encounters or altercations with skinwalkers, is one not largely outspoken by them much, like a Vatican exorcist. Most modern encounters today are either a host seeking help from the medicine man, either spiritually, holistically, or physically. In most ways, they are like priests. People find comfort in their prayers, blessing and guidance in times they don't understand fully, or seeking just to be enlightened by words, wisdom, or knowledge. They are also like an alternative psychiatrist or therapist with experience in medicinal remedies, psychological therapy, or physical therapy. From what I was able to piece together from bits and parts of other stories, a group of medicine men, when horses were introduced to Navajos, some with their own abilities being mediums, energy drawers, conduits, some supernatural or natural would investigate claims and rumors around the Navajo Nation, seeking out these skinwalkers, or spiritual and unexplainable phenomenons. Peoples who become host to its strange phenomenons would seek out these medicine men for help, some even traveling hundreds of miles to the southwest. In one such encounter, I've heard from an elder is that when he was a young boy, becoming a man, his grandfather's grandfather would ride around the Navajo Nation and off, sometimes going as far into the Canadian territories to the Northern Territory of Mexico, helping people of all ailments, spiritually and physically, under discretion and some form of payment. He then talked about when they would come across definite proof of demonic hauntings and presences, much like how a church would investigate demonic presences. One encounter he does remember that happened in the heartland regions of the Navajo Nation. An elderly man spent a week herding his livestock to their winter property. When he finally returned home in the day, he found that his wife had not prepared their wagons with their belongings. But, seeing her rifle and horse were gone, she must be getting supplies or went to visit other nearby residents they know in their rural region. Times back in the day for Navajo, they kept busy all day, much like ranchers and farmers. They were always cautious of strangers and burglarizing and ransacking of property was common, but low. Land tracking was a very common skill before it wasn't. He then noticed nothing was disturbed or out of the ordinary for them, but had a feeling his wife went to a nearby friend's. His gut feeling was right, and seen that his wife was there, but also asked why she left their place with their valuables and wagons unguarded. She told him the following, that one of the goats came back and only stood in one direction. Stick in hand, an attempt to snap it out of whatever trance it was in. It screamed and dropped dead. She thought it could be the ailments or termites in its horns, eating away at its brain. She did not want to waste whatever was salvageable. She butchered the goat and hung its wool skin to dry in the sun, putting the still intact headless goat in back of one of the wagons. As she went about, finishing chores to pack the wagon, she heard rattling outside. Thinking it was a rattlesnake on the property, getting ready for fall, she went to find it, but came to notice the sheepskin was gone. Thinking somebody is on the property and robbing them, she went into the Hogan to get her rifle. Gun at the ready, she didn't get far before noticing that the goat skin was dragging on the ground. Thinking it was animals instead, she followed the dragging trail 
and kept an eye for an animal in the distance. Instead, she noticed not far ahead, the skin hide was dragging itself, gliding over the ground. She shot at it more than several times, but it kept going towards some washes in the land with hill terrain. Unsure of what she had seen, she decided to not stay the night and left to the neighbors. Hearing this, the husband had her and the neighbors go find the local medicine men, common in the area, but would be a couple of days. Returning with an elderly medicine man, three men accompanied him. The wife then showed them where she stopped following the skin, and they went on from there. Unable to accompany them, the husband and wife kept a bonfire going all night as a waypoint for them to see in the night sky. Late into the first night, one man came back and asked if they could spare a horse, as one of theirs had fallen into a ditch and severely injured itself. They had to shoot it. Agreeing, they let him take the husband's horse, as it was fast and knew the area. Into the next day, no sign of them returning happened. Then, night came. They built the bonfire again, so they would be able to see if they were near. Not long after, another one of the men came back and asked if they could spare another horse. Agreeing, thinking something again happened to their horse, they took the wagon horse. Later into the night, the final third man of the group came to the house and asked if they had yet another horse they could spare. Anxious on an update, the husband asked if they had found the goat skin. Not saying anything else, the third man asked again if they had another horse to spare. The husband agreed meanly, only that he can check on his other horses. The third man agreed, and they rode into the night. Coming upon a ridge in the night, lightened up by the full moon, and the third man rode to the sound of a sweat lodge ceremony. The medicine man and two other men were doing. Coming upon the sweat lodge, he respected the strict custom around medicine man in the middle of ceremonies. He stayed silent. It is custom among Navajo culture to be silent during a ceremony and not to break the concentration of the medicine man and strict lesson, never question what they do. The third man told the husband not to look into the open. He had to keep the glowing dim lava rocks hot and not to look back until they are done. While he sat there with the low dim fire and keeping the rocks hot, listening to the chanting, he seen a blurry white mass out in the distance below. No ambient light came from it, only a white mass, like something wearing all white in the moonlight. Being atop a cliff, looking down below to a barren, flat desert and washes, he seen it darting left and right, going into washes and coming out, going hundreds of feet in no pattern, faster than a horse can run, and way faster than somebody who can even run fast. Twilight was coming up, and the white mass disappeared into a wash to his right, and never came back out. He observed everywhere below, to see where it was, and still listened to the song the medicine man and his assistant were singing. He could hear the heavy footsteps of his wife's horse, and he did as what he was told, and did not turn around once to check on the horse. But then, the heavy horse thud's steps got closer to him, in a rhythm of two. Like someone walking, and he was on high alert to turn around. Then, he felt a hard clutch on his shoulder. He screamed and cried out in agony, yelling, and was ready to fight whatever it was in the night. But it was the old medicine man. The husband was frightened by feeling, a strong feeling, and a heavy presence. The old man asked what he was doing far out, away from his home. Confused, 
he said he came along with one of the old man's assistants to check on his horses, but instead he made him a fire watcher. The old man with concern said they had seen the skin and they were chasing it into washes to trap it in the high sand walls, but it had killed two of his men the first night when they entered the wash by collapsing the side walls when they got close to the skin on the ground. He and his last assistant went on to trap it in the cliff sides during the day, but he could not get to the top of the cliff to where it was at. So he went ahead and his last assistant stayed where it had last seen below. He went along around the cliff sides to find a trail up, but that took most of the day and he came upon the husband. He followed the smell of dead animal and seen scattered meat and blood. Then, heard the sound of a drumming ceremony in the night, but could not tell where it was until the sky lightened up from the early morning. Then, he had finally seen him there, sitting near the edge of the cliff. Thinking he was being tricked, the husband opened the makeshift sweat lodge doorway, seeing inside. It was made of his horse's bones and not wood. And there, laid on the opposite side of the door, he seen the goat skin. The medicine man took the skin and they burned down the sweat lodge to ashes and bonfire. The husband asked how a skin could do all that. The old medicine man explained that something else in the night came for the skin on the second night. They thought it was him, the husband coming out to find them, but it wasn't. They wrote the sounds of heavy galloping and dark flashes of something in the moonlight. In the nights, they hunted it like predator animals and tried luring it into washes or caves in the washes by sacrificing one of their horses to collapse in the high sand walls, but no avail. Returning back to the husband's house, the wife told them that where she had put the carcass of the goat, it was gone and no tracks could be seen. When time came to go to their winter property, they never returned back to their original property. Time passed and the sand dunes and the Hogan, with no upkeep, soon fell apart over the years. When it finally collapsed in, it was never rebuilt. The way the Indians do is to dry their corn and dig a hole beside the Hogan and put it down there. Then they put a stone over it and some dirt and weeds so no one will find it and then they take their goats and sheep back into the mountains for the winter. When they want some corn, they go to their Hogan and get it. A family did that, and after a while, they needed some more corn. They had a very pretty daughter, and lots of men wanted to marry her. They sent her with her little brother to go get it. They both rode on one horse, and when they got there, they said it was too late to go home they would get the corn in the morning. So they went into the Hogan that they were going to sleep in. They had tied the two front of their horse and he went off to feed, but he kept coming back to the Hogan and his ears were up. He could see better than they could in the dark and the girl knew somebody was out there because in the afternoon, some men had been near there and one man said, now I can get that girl and all the other men went away. And at night, she saw a dark shadow in the woods. She knew a human wolf was after her, but she did not tell her brother. So she dug a hole under the Hogan, and she told her little brother to get into it. If anyone came, he was to crawl outside and ride fast to their family, and she would try to fight as long as she could. She tied the blanket over the door as much as she could, so it would take the wolf a long time to get in, and the boy could get away. Then, later in the night, she heard some mud fall off the top of the Hogan, and she knew the wolf had come. The boy crawled out, and he cut the rope around the horse's feet. He jumped on the horse, and the horse was scared. 
He didn't want to stay there, and the boy didn't need to whip him or hold the reins. He ran as fast as he could, and the boy held on to his mane. Then the wolf came in, and she fought him as hard as she could. Pretty soon, the boy got home and he told his family, and his father and mother got on their horses, and they rode as fast as they could back to the sister. Her big brother was not at home. He had made a long bow and lots of fine arrows with eagle feathers on them. He could sure shoot. He went out hunting that day and stopped at a hogan for the night. Indians do that when they are away from home. That night, it snowed a little, and the next morning, he said, This is a good day for hunting. I guess I will shoot some rabbits. And it was snowing, and he had some good new moccasins with heavy soles, and he had his feet in burlap sacks to keep them dry. It was snowing, and he was a fine shot. He could hit whatever he wanted to. He saw two rabbits, and he took two arrows and he shot them. He never missed. He was riding along, and he saw a big track, but the snow had covered it, and he did not know whether it was a horse or a man or some animal. So he blew the snow out of the track, and then he knew it was a human wolf, and there was blood too. So he followed that track. He followed it all day, and toward evening, he came to the edge of a mesa, and he crawled slowly to the edge, and he had one arrow in his bow, and two in his mouth. At the edge, he came to the last track made by that human wolf, and there was no way to get down that cliff. So he circled around, and he found just one narrow path going down. He went along and saw a big stone lying against a cliff and he knew that was where the human wolf was. He pulled back the stone and went into the cave and saw nothing, and pretty soon he came back to a black curtain. He pulled that back and he went in. There was a narrow passage, and he went along for a half mile. Then he came to another black curtain. In a half mile, he came to another. Then he came to a fourth one, he pulled that back and found himself in a big room, which was round like a hogan, and he saw lots of men and women sitting around. They were the ones he had seen at dances or ceremonies and around the hogans. He saw skeletons and bones and jewelry and lots of things around the walls. He thought, now they will kill me. There was a small room at the left, and he went in there, and he hoped they wouldn't see him. There was a big fat man, and he was chief, and he was singing. And all these people, even girls and boys, were learning how to be human wolves. The fat man said, There's an old lady who has died about 200 miles from here, and I want two men to go there, dig her up, and take her jewelry. So two men came in front of him and sang over them and he said to be careful. They took their skins and went out. Then the people said, There is a boy in here, and he does not belong to us. So they brought him out, and they put him in the middle, and they wanted to kill him. He was thinking how he could get out of there. He wanted to get their eagle feathers because that was the main thing to all this, and then everything would go wrong with them and they would have to stop. But they were all around him, and they were watching him. And up on the wall ahead of him was a girl's head, and he kept looking at it. But he didn't know it was his sister. Then the man said, Do you want to be a human wolf? He didn't want to, but the man said, You can study to be a wolf, or we will kill you. So he agreed. And all the time he was thinking, how he could get out of there. On each side of the door, they had a big dog, so if he ran out, they would make noise and stop him. Then, they passed some meat. He didn't want it because he knew it was human meat, but he did not know it was his sister's. He thought he had better take some, 
so he took a piece, put it near his mouth, and then he put it down inside his shirt. He thought, when I go out, I will give a piece to those dogs, and they won't make noise. Soon, the man fell asleep, and the boy pretended he was asleep. He snored, yet all the time he was looking around, his eyes were almost shut. Then, after a while, all of them were asleep because they knew the dogs would make a noise if he tried to go out. Then he got up and took his bow and arrows, which they had taken away from him. He took a bunch of the eagle feathers. He took a step toward the door, then another, and then one dog began to growl. Then he took the meat out of his shirt and broke it into two pieces and gave a piece of the meat to the dog. They were hungry and they wanted that meat. Then he ran through the curtain as fast as he could. They had put wood and stones behind the curtains so he would have a hard time. But he got through, three of them, all right. And then he heard a lot of noise among those people. He sure had a hard time getting through that last curtain and he had to push big logs and stones away. And then he ran as fast as he could. He was a fine runner, but soon he heard a wolf over there, and then over there, and then he knew they were all around him. He came to a badger's hole, and he pulled up a big weed, and crawled into the hole and pulled the weed down hard so it looked like it was growing there. Pretty soon the noises stopped, and he pushed up the weed and looked around, and heard someone coming. He went down again, and the fat man came running, and he ran right over the hole. He heard him say, I wish we had killed them like I told them to. After a while, the boy came out and ran home, and when he got there, the sole of his moccasin was worn out, and his foot sore. In one or two nights, there was a war dance near, and his family went over there, but he didn't because his foot was sore. But later, he took his bow and his arrows like a cane, and he thought he would walk over there. When he got there, he saw that same fat man who was chief of the human wolves, sitting on a big white horse, dressed in fine clothes, and he had lots of necklaces, jewelry, and bracelets, and his wife had too. The boy said, I'm going to shoot that man. So he ran around the circle of the wagons and people until they came behind him. Then, he put an arrow in and gave a long pull. He aimed at the man's neck, shot the arrow, and it went in so far that only a little bit, one inch, was showing. 